could take their seat, that would be great. Hello, everybody. Hello. Um, can we take our seats and get started right on time? Thank you all for coming. This is a great turn. Global Warming Action Coalition, which is the sponsor of tonight's event. And I'm also with Sustainable Middlesex. I know many of you are involved in that too. And Sustainable Middlesex brings a lot of the individual town grassroots groups together to act in, uh, in concert. And I'll talk on that just a second. But first of all, this is a fabulous turnout. And what's really exciting to me is how many different towns we have represented here. I see Arlington, Wellesley, uh, I see uh, Belmont, Winchester, Brookline. Who am I missing? Carlisle. Uh, Sudbury. 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 Western. Well, it's great to see so many people interested in this topic. Um, uh, I, I'm just glad that uh, the Patriots were on Monday Night Football this week. I think that makes things a little bit easier, too. Uh, two quick announcements uh, before I turn things over uh, to uh, Mike Barrett and Mark Breslow. Um, I'm not sure if how you got the message of this event and others, but if you'd like to be on the Sustainable Middlesex uh, um, mailing list, as always holding it up in the back, please sign up and we'll make sure you hear about events like this going forward. Uh, I also want to emphasize, I think there's some flyers back there, uh, the Sustainable Winchester folks, uh, Fred Yen in particular, has put a fabulous presentation together entitled Preparing Our Communities for Extreme Climate Change. And that event is going to be on November 1st in Winchester with great speakers, Kathy Baskin, MA Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, Susan Condon, <laughs> Uh, the Associate Commissioner for the MA um, Massachusetts Center of Environmental Health, and on and on. So that's going to be a great presentation. Uh, I think there are more flyers back there. If there aren't, uh, let me know. Also, um, a very important meeting, I think, is going to be held on December 6th, and that's where Sustainable Middlesex and the climate exchange folks and Mike Barrett and others are going to come together to really organize us. How do these individual groups interested in the carbon tax organize their efforts so we can get it passed in Massachusetts? So I hope uh, all of you will be able to join us for that. Well, um, you know, I think everyone in this room knows about um, the importance of the carbon tax in terms of addressing the issue of heat trapping gases. And perhaps uh, you have read the Remy study, which talks about the positive impact the carbon would catch would have on the macro economy. Well, I think the other question that needs to be answered, and I think we're gonna address tonight in part, or Mark will address tonight in part, is what does it mean for an individual? 
and what does it mean for a business? We need to understand that side of it just as well. So in order to introduce Mark, I would actually like Mike Barrett, our state senator, to come up and do that introduction. I just want to say Mike is my state senator from Lexington. I know you represent Newton, Bedford, Concord, Carlisle, Carlisle. Yeah. And I, I just want to say I am absolutely feel so fortunate to have Mike as our state senator. The imagination, the courage, and the leadership that he's provided in the carbon tax is absolutely outstanding and really can't be beat. So uh, I look forward to it. Hasten to add that I also represent Sudbury and Weston and Chelmsford. Uh, I don't want to leave out any communities. That would be uh, embarrassing. I I'm an enormously uh, happy to be introducing Mark Breslow, who's a gifted economist and who's helping us wrestle with one of the issues that actually people in this audience have identified uh, in previous discussions about the carbon tax. The question, one of the questions that's, that's worried us is uh, the regressive potential of the tax and what do you do with the equity argument. And I really do want to thank some very familiar faces that I see here um, because you flagged this equity issue. You're concerned about income disparities. You want to fight climate change, but not in a way that devastates working people. So I and other proponents have heard you loud and clear. But to, to set a somewhat broader context for Mark's presentation, I, uh, I want to quote something that, that I saw as I was drafting and exchanging drafts with Representative Tom Conroy looking towards a carbon tax. So this was in the, just after I had been elected in the months leading up to January 1st, 2013. And as I was fooling around with, with language, uh, this was a thinking about Mark's presentation and its ultimate context that was a, involved a trip down memory lane. Here's the headline that I encountered in November of 2012, one week after I was elected, and as I was tooling with around on legislative language. The headline read, Obama spokesman, quote, we would never propose a carbon tax, <clears throat> end quote. And he was dealing with uh, a series of conservative attacks that suggested that everything he might do with respect to climate change was tantamount to a tax. And at that time, the notion that we would put a price on carbon was so novel for this country that Obama's folks felt impelled to quiet it, to immediately put the possibility to rest. What became especially problematical for me as I, as I was writing language was that I knew that uh, Governor Patrick and President Obama were extremely close. One of the things that's impressed me, um, and I'm a huge fan of both men, is that Massachusetts public policy initiatives and uh, national initiatives often seem to fit hand in glove. Uh, the president will move on a front, the governor will often do something quite creative to highlight the presidential initiative locally. I was concerned that this would work in reverse where the carbon tax is involved and that the disclaimer by the president's press secretary would immediately put the damper on this legislation that we were drafting. And I only uh, make mention of this because um, as of June 2014, uh, 18 months after that disclaimer was issued, New headlines appeared in the paper, and I'm just quoting one, but it could have been of several. Um, on climate change, Obama is finally leading from the front. This was a headline, uh, an interview that the president did with Tom Friedman of the New York Times, in which he explicitly said that the United States should be willing to consider putting a price on carbon. And he used those words, putting a price on carbon, and he did it in the face of intense pushback from conservatives in Congress, who had been dogging him at every step for the entire 18 months uh, on precisely this question. So the president really is cutting a profile in courage and deserves enormous. He's dealing in a political environment that we can scarcely imagine here in Massachusetts as we propose a statewide version of a carbon tax. And yet he's finally 
putting all his chips out there, which leads us to uh, a study that the Patrick administration is doing with respect to climate change. I, I authored an amendment during a budget debate a year ago. This was after I had submitted the bill. I wanted to see if the executive branch would uh, join this issue of a carbon tax. Um, I knew that the president at that time was on record against it. I was trying to figure out how um, I might entice the, uh, the governor to take a look at it and, and I scribbled something on the back of an envelope to this effect. I, I figured that this might, might work, that um, the executive branch should conduct a study about all the implications that would follow if the legislature mandated a carbon tax and the executive branch had to implement it. It would be in the nature, I thought, of contingency planning. And in that way, wouldn't position the governor on an issue that he hadn't yet taken a public position on, but would enable them to do, in fact, contingency planning in case we managed to pass a carbon tax. Uh, that amendment passed the Senate. Um, it passed the House. It went to the governor in June of 2013, and he vetoed it, uh, which was uh, uh, a, another setback on this circuitous road. But I got a call from Rick Sullivan, the Secretary of Environmental Affairs for the Patrick administration, who explained to me that the veto itself wasn't the final word, that they had been intrigued by the general notion, and that they proposed to undertake the study on their own. Uh, and it wouldn't just be a contingency study. To their enormous credit, they proposed to take an absolute look at every conceivable aspect of a carbon tax. So this idea that, ha that in November of 2012 had begun with an absolute disclaimer from the White House uh, was slowly taking root here in Massachusetts. And it's clear now that Governor Patrick is prepared to go way out front. And he deserves enormous credit because the study that they've undertaken uh, is informed effectively by the discussions that have taken place in this very room and the GWAC uh, and sustainable Middlesex organizations that have brought you together this evening have, have surfaced. And the question of equity and fairness uh, in the study that the Patrick administration has <laughs> undertaken is key. Uh, Mark Breslow, as I say, is a gifted economist who's tackled the issue for us uh, head on, you're going to be surprised by the counterintuitive data that he has to present to you. It's going to stimulate, I think, and provoke a lot of thought on your parts. I'm, I'm very interested in what you're going to have to say about Mark's research and about where it points us. There is an equity problem. It's not quite the equity problem that any of us imagined when we thought about this 18 months ago, but there are some thorny issues nevertheless. And uh, as I look toward reintroducing a carbon tax bill, and we do look forward to uh, using this study to redraft our previous legislation, submit a new one for January 2015, assuming we're reelected. Uh, as we look forward to this, this, this uh, brilliant research that Mark has done I hope, is going to illuminate the way forward on the fairness question. And so with that long-winded uh, expression of context, I want to introduce uh, uh, Mark Breslow, PhD, uh, to talk about research on Im business and individual impacts and implications of a tax. Hi, thanks everybody for having me here tonight. Um, I should say it's a bit more context that I'm part of a consulting team that's doing a study for the state's Department of Energy Resources. I have one piece of the study that I'm focused on, which is the distributional or equity part of the bill. Um, but there's a lot more to the bill than that, and I think I should start by just giving a bit of essentials of the stuff that I'm actually not focused on. Um, so the most essential thing is creating a tax. Right now, um, the modeling that's being done by an organization called REMI, Regional Economic Models, Inc., um, which is used heavily by state governments across the country, especially in the Northeast, um, is modeling a carbon tax that would start at $10 per ton um, in its first year, 
go up by $5 a year until it gets to $30, and then go up more gradually after that, but eventually get to $75 a ton by 2040. Um, so uh, it's definitely, it's somewhere, it's not trivial, but it's also not um, like enough to revolutionize the energy system. And I think in part we have to recognize, just as happened with REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, that's hard for one state or even one group of states to get too far out ahead of everybody else because you are in a competitive situation. So we are trying to make mass be a model for this, but um, we need to pull everybody else along with us. Um, and the, um, the equity issues basically come up because energy is um, what, what's known as a, as a regressively distributed product. Um, I'm not using the terminology quite right. But essentially, it's, it's a product where no matter how low your income, you need to use a lot of it. Um, people use more of it the more affluent they are, but use of energy does not go up as fast as income does. Um, so if you tax something like that, you're in danger of imposing a higher burden on low-income people than on high-income people. Um, and we have to figure out a way not to do that because we certainly don't want to burden um, the people who can least afford it. Um, so some of the essentials. What is a carbon tax? The government sets a, sets a tax or a fee. We're going to see if we can get it everybody to accept the word fee, but that may not happen. Um, equal to a dollar amount per ton of CO2, carbon dioxide, that's emitted by burning a fossil fuel. Um, in at least this first pass, we're going to limit this just to the main um, sources of carbon dioxide in the state, which is burning fuel oil, gasoline, diesel fuel, coal, which is almost out of fashion here, um, and natural gas. We're not going to try, probably, to go after some of the smaller sources, nor um, the life cycle impacts of products that we import into the state, which have essentially carbon emissions embodied in them. Um, hope we'll get to that sometime, but it's not going to happen immediately. Um, REMI is modeling a tax that rises each year, starts at $10, goes to $30 in five years. Um, the big thing that's essential and that's different on this is that we're proposing that it be revenue neutral, which means the government doesn't get to keep any of the money. Um, this is different from the way REGI works, um, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, in which you may know that the state does get the revenue. Um, prices are low on REGI, so it's not an enormous amount of revenue, but it is something like 80 or $100 million a year that the state of Mass takes in and uses primarily to fund energy efficiency programs. Uh, the idea of revenue neutrality is that if you're not revenue neutral, it's a tax. It's just a new tax. And we know the state isn't very happy about new taxes and tends to vote against them. Um, so by saying something's revenue neutral, what we're saying is we want to make fossil fuels more expensive. We want to dissuade people from using fossil fuels or to find ways to use less of them. But this is not a new way of government taking in revenue to create new programs. Right? You, we're going to give you your money back somehow, exactly how we've, we're working on it. Um, but the basic point is to say this is not just another way of government taking your money. Um, and I at least think that's essential if we're going to get a carbon tax that's big enough to matter. A problem with REGI is that it's a cap-and-trade program, it's a wonderful nation-leading thing that we did, but the price is quite low. Um, REGI allowances are only running for four or five dollars a ton now, um, which is not enough to make a big difference to what people use in terms of car uh, carbon-based fuels. Um, we need a much higher carbon tax than that, um, and that's why this goes to $30 and more later. But once you get start getting to $30 or more, you're talking about a lot of money. Um, at $30 a ton, you're talking about increasing the state's tax take by about $2 billion, 
which is about 10% of what the state <coughs> takes in in taxes now. Um, that's a big jump. Um, and we need it in terms of raising the prices, but we don't need it in terms of people resisting more state programs. Um, by being revenue neutral, we hope that we defeat that argument. Um, so households as a whole get back the amount of tax they pay, pay in. Businesses and institutions as a whole get back most of what they put in. Um, all We've been talking about all. I may modify what I say about that a bit. Um, but we have the senator here. And it's his bill, so he's the one who will really decide this. Um, now, people sometimes say, well, if you're going to give the money back, then what's the whole point of it? Why are you just taking money from it and giving it back? How is that going to affect anything? Um, and it, it is kind of a tricky question. So th the point is that we're going to take it back from you by raising the price of gasoline at the pump, raising the price of natural gas to heat your home, and maybe further raising the price of electricity, which is supposed to affect you by trying to get you to say, how can I conserve on this? How can I buy a more efficient appliance, more efficient car? How can I drive less? And so on. Um, if we give you the money back, you're not going to necessarily spend all the money we give you back on just buying more gasoline. Right? If we raise your gasoline prices, say, 500 a year, and then we give you 500, you won't necessarily spend it all on gasoline. You'll spend probably some of it on gasoline, but if you're smart, you'll say, how can I use less gasoline and use some of this money to go out to dinner, go out to a movie, do anything else that I might want to spend my money on? And that's generally the assumption in economics. Um, and I, I don't think it's an unreasonable one in this case, that um, you give people money, they spend it on everything that they would spend their general income on, not just on the thing that you raised the price of. Does that sound reasonable to folks? Mm -hmm. Yes. Doesn't sound reasonable to everybody. <laughs> um, right, in, in doing this study, one of the problems that I've had is that the data is not so good. Um, doing the analysis of how this will affect households is based on federal government surveys of um, households in every, in every state um, in which they actually have somebody ask people, what do you spend your money on? Um, they do it either by phone or in person. Um, and a sample is more accurate the more people you talk to, the bigger your sample size. Um, I'm not an expert on this. Lori's <coughs> husband is, right? Um, uh, in on a national level, this is a pretty big sample. On a state level, they have only sampled something like 750 households, which is sort of enough to do the job if you're looking at all 750. But once you start breaking down the 750 into smaller groups, like if you divide it into five or ten groups by their income level, and then you divide it into groups by how big their household is, you start getting groups that don't have too many people in it. <coughs> where you might only have, say, 10 people who have low incomes, but four people in their household. And at that point, the statistics start becoming unreliable. You don't know whether your sample is very representative of everyone who lives in the state. So we're using that data, but um, with a grain of salt. We're not sh sure exactly how accurate it is. And the more I delve in into this, the more I become concerned of that because I can actually look at some of the numbers and see that we have things that might be outliers, like a household that spends $8,000 a year on gasoline, even though their income is only $20,000. Um, and there are things like that reported in the data. Um, how are we going to give the money back? Um, first, I'm talking about households. So we have two proposals. Either give every household the same dollar rebate, um, or um, give households rebates based on the number of people in the household. Um, when Remy did a national study on this topic, they sort of did a mixture. They said, we'll give equal rebates per adult and a half rebate per child. Maximum of two children. Maximum of two children, okay. Um, I'll bet some people who didn't like that one. Um, okay. Um, now, um, 
when this topic has been talked about for many years among <coughs> economists, at least the idea of what's called environmental tax shifting, where you raise the price of something that's polluting, and you use that money to reduce other taxes, um, taxes on things that we like people to do, like work. So we currently tax work at a pretty heavy rate. The federal income tax rate, the state income tax rate, Social Security, Medicare taxes. Um, in economics, the theory is that dissuades people from working to a degree. That's, I think, kind of a shaky argument. Um, but the thought has been, we create a carbon tax and use that to reduce some other tax. It doesn't turn out to work very well, um, basically because our taxes in Massachusetts don't fall very much on low-income people. Um, the bottom fifth, which is what I'm going to call low income, pay almost no income tax in this state. They only pay about 5% of property taxes that are levied on households and about 6% of the sales tax. In contrast, um, my estimate from the data is that the bottom fifth would pay about 12% of the carbon tax. So what that means is, for, for example, if you were to compensate for the carbon tax by reducing sales taxes. Um, since the bottom fifth pays twice as much of the carbon tax as they do in sales tax, they would only get back half as much as their taxes went up. All right? um, sometimes math is hard to go through. But the, the, ant the answer is none of the major taxes in Massachusetts Reducing them would not adequately compensate low-income people or even moderate-income people. If instead we do rebates that are separate from existing taxes, but we do rebates that are equal per household, that means that the bottom 20% of households, which is just counting households, would get 20% of the rebates. All right, 20% is greater than 12%. So it means the bottom 20% of households are going to get back more than they put in. All right? um, in contrast, the top 20% will get back less than they put in. And uh, otherwise, How does that make sense? How does that make sense? In yeah, terms you, you, you want people to change behavior. Yep. So if you give them extra money, uh, people will not change behavior in terms of saving them on, on, on well, the one. Uh, well, this is. Just, okay. I mean, could you also tell us what, what exactly, how much money are we talking about instead of all these percentages? Are we talking about $100, $200 for a household or what? Yeah. Um, it's not big money. At least not well, for the lower Well, you're level. talking about um, when you get to $30, it's about $2 billion a year. There's 6 million people in the state. So you're talking about... So let's, let's start with what you start out with, like $5, 10 Right. Well, it's not going to make much difference at that, but uh -huh. we, need, we need a phase in. So by the end of the fifth year, you're at $30. Okay. And that's going to cost the average, well, the average person, like 330 So the average household would be paying like $600 a year, maybe. Um, so it's not, I agree, it's not enough to dramatically change behavior, but it's enough to change some behavior. Now also remember, we're sitting in Lexington right here, right? Lexington is a red, relatively affluent community. Um, $600 may not sound like very much here, but if you're living, if you're making $10 an hour, uh, and I know people who make that much, $600 is a lot of money. Yes? How, how much is it per gallon of gas? It's a good question. Um, rough uh, guideline is a dollar a ton on the carbon tax is a penny a gallon. So at $30 a ton, it's 30 cents a gallon, which means you're raising the price of gas by less than 10%. Right? Which and that's if, how it fluctuates all the way. It does. Um, but so 30 cents is not enough to like cause everybody to go sell their cars and ride bikes everywhere. Um, but it is enough to cause some small reduction in gasoline use. Again, the, the economics of this there's a technical term called demand elasticity, which basically means if we increase the price of gas by 10%, by what percent will you reduce your use of gas? And, and it 
it becomes more the longer the time period you have, because you're not going to reduce your use tomorrow very much. But three years from now, you might sell your car and buy a more efficient car, or you might move closer to your workplace. Um, so the elasticity for gasoline is estimated to be about 0 0.6 if you take, if you wait 10 years. All right, meaning that if we raise the price of gas by 10%. The demand for gas will go down about six percent by the end of ten years. All right, um, not, not going to happen immediately, but you can't <clears throat> smash people over the head immediately. People have lifestyles which they cannot change tomorrow, especially if they're not affluent. Um, okay. Yes. This maybe just a really fundamental question that everybody here already understands, but. I, I, what you're talking about here is a tax directly on homeowners, business, you know, people who run businesses that are using heat or maybe electricity to run their homes. Well, what about like the oil that's coming into the into the state, or or people that are are actually refining the natural gas? Or how, are there is well, there going to be a tax at that level, or is it just on the consumer? Yeah. Level? Um, well, again, this is one Senator Barrett and his staff will need to work out, okay. but. Um, in the case of Reggie, the existing fee on, or the cap and trade system on electricity, it's imposed at the level of the generator of power. If you've got a generating plant, you have to buy allowances to emit pollution. All right? So it's not imposed at the individual family level. All right? The generators pay it, and then they may or may not pass it on to us. And probably we'd be proposing the same thing, that the taxes would be imposed as high up in the system as we can, which probably means the first point of sale in Massachusetts. So say for gasoline, it would be on the distributors of gas who bring gas into the state. And they're going to pass it on, presumably. Um, but it's not going to be something lower down. Okay. Um, and for natural gas, it would be the same thing. The gas utilities buy natural gas that comes from Texas or Louisiana or somewhere else in the world, the tax would happen when the companies that bring the gas through a pipeline or on a ship first bring it into the state. Okay. All right. Um, this shows you our estimate of how much of the carbon tax would be paid by each income quintile. Quintile is just a fancy name for 20% of the popu population or 20% of households in this case. Um, and what it shows you is that the amount of tax paid, which is dependent, mainly dependent on how much energy you consume, goes up as your income goes up. All right? Um, so the lowest 20% would pay 12, about 12.5%. 12 um, the top 20% of households would be paying like 28%. Right? So if you're affluent, you will pay more of the carbon tax. But it doesn't go up as fast as income, because the top 20% make like five times what the bottom 20% make. All right? So you're in danger, um, because the numbers look like this, of making life more difficult for low and moderate income people. And the essence of my work is trying to figure out a way around that. Um, so. The findings that we've got are based on, I've done the analysis two ways, either equal rebates per household or equal rebates per person. This graph is based on equal rebates per household. Um, and I'm still working on these numbers, so take them with a grain of salt. Um, but at a $30 per ton tax, this would mean that each household would get about $500 back as a credit or rebate. Right? Um, how much money, more money you spend for energy changes for every household. Everyone in this room spends different amounts of money on gasoline, natural gas, electricity. So it's going to be different for every person, every household. Um, so it's hard to say what the impacts are. But on average, if you look at the bars in this graph, um, the uh, 
the gray bars, which are the same for all five quintiles, that's your rebate, right? It's $500 no matter where you are. The black bars is how much your cost, how much you're paying in for the carbon tax, right? So this is saying that low-income people will be paying something like $320 a year in carbon tax, all right? And high-income people will be paying $750 or so, all right? Then if you take gray minus black, what you get back minus what you put in, you get the, dat, the dotted bar. This is the net impact on your household. Um, so on average, and I'm going to keep emphasizing that, the lowest income households will get back about $180 more than they put in. All right? Next, next quintile, less than that. The third and fourth quintiles lose a little bit, but it's very little. This is like $20 and this is $40. So I think I'm not lying too much if I say they're coming out about even. Um, the top household, the top fifth will get um, be behind by about $260, which for most affluent people, $260 a year is not going to kill them. Um, but it's hopefully enough to make people think a little bit about how can we conserve on energy. Um, so this is the basis for our modeling and for proposing um, an equal tax, an equal rebate per household. You can do a similar analysis, and they've been done for other places, um, where you give the money back per person, right? Um, and you get reasonably similar results. Um, although, one unexpected thing that people don't think of is that a lot of people think that poor people have a lot of kids and have big families. Um, it actually turns out that the statistics don't show that, that at all. Um, household size in the United States gets bigger on average, the more affluent you are. So for the bottom three quintiles, the average household size is about two people. For this one, it's about two and a half. And for this, it's three. Okay? Yeah? How, how does uh, the rate scheme figure into this? Because uh, there are regulations that are federal, and they will have to be observed also. Uh, well, it's actually, it's actually, Reggie's not federal, it's 10, ten yeah, states. Yeah, but uh, there are new federal regulations, right? Coming in well, from, uh, the, from Obama that will have all yes. those to be... Yes, so, you, you so question, please? Um, his question is basically, if we've already got an electricity system that has Reggie in it, and that Obama's proposing to put new regulations on power plants. How is this going to work with that? Um, and the answer is, mostly, we don't know. <laughs> it's going to lower those figures. Um, somewhat, but, no, but we, do, we do have some ideas. We, we have thought that out of mind, correct? Right. We we do have ideas. I don't think we have a clear answer yet, um, but perhaps of some comfort, though, is that Massachusetts already has a long history of trying to reduce emissions from the electricity sector. So we already have a pretty clean electricity sector. Electricity is now less than 20 percent of our emissions. Um, so the other 80% is mainly heating fuels and gasoline. So that this carbon tax will mostly affect that. Yeah. Okay? Yes? Could, could you explain the advantages or relative advantages or disadvantages of households versus individuals? Um, for example, I could see people saying this tax on marriage. They'll come up with all sorts of stuff. <laughs> right. Um, um, yeah, so I, I agree that that's a problem. Um, well, to, to be quite honest, the main reason for doing it by household is because that's the way the federal data is available. <laughs> um, the federal survey data divides the population <coughs> into fifths by household. Um, so I actually don't have data by individuals. Um, so it's a very pragmatic choice. Um, and uh, other than that, I'm not sure that there'd be any reason to prefer households versus individuals. And individuals might be the better choice. Um, the one disadvantage of doing it by individuals is that because more affluent households are, have more people in them, you would actually be shifting some money 
up the income scale that way. Um, but you also, it's complicated because at this end, the average number of people per household is only two. But some households are bigger. Some poor households do have four people or five people. And when I start looking deeply into the numbers, a low-income household that has four or five people under this scheme is actually going to lose a lot of money on it, those people. It's a small percentage of low-income households, but they're going to lose. So, so there's, this, there's some tricky trade-offs here. Um, and Remy actually modeled, they took the, when they did their macro model, they took the household way of doing it and the individual way of doing it and did it half and half. The other countries that have carbon taxes, is there any kind of consensus on how they solve this problem? Um, well, it's actually, in, in British Columbia, um, which is right the only province in Canada that we know of that's done this, um, I believe, you may know better than me, Zori, I believe they do it by household, I think. Um, in Europe, they're so used to high energy prices that they basically don't give you the money back. Right? They, Europe has a whole different way of operating. They tax a lot, and they have very generous social welfare programs and services. So they just have big taxes, right? You just pay $6 or $7 a gallon for gas, and you don't get the money back. In uh, British Columbia, they just reduce some of the taxes. And they're all the taxes paid by rich people. So the poor type of bastards and the lower rate sections get hit both ways. Mm -hmm. So I'm delighted you're being concerned about the fairness. Right. We are very concerned. And um, I, I was telling the senator that stuff that I hadn't quite said before, that um, the averages look good here. This looks like it comes out well. The problem is that the average is high what happens to individual households. So there are some low-income households that spend, say, $4,000 a year on gasoline because they have to drive a lot of what, a long way to get to their minimum wage job. Um, so we have to be careful to think about how we handle them. And would the elasticity demand be, it's more difficult for lower households, lower income buying a car, so they're stuck a little bit more in terms of how much energy they're using. Would you say, is that what's Um, well, it's, that's actually not my, that's Remy's part of the analysis, but um, it's complicated because what you said is true. If you're low income, you're not going to go out and buy a Prius. On the other hand, um, you may just drive less. Right? You don't go and drive 100 miles for you know, whatever you feel like doing that day. Whereas for more of the people in this room, you're not going to cut back your, your amount of driving. You're going to drive when you feel like it. So I'm not sure whether the elasticities are higher or lower depending on income. Yes. As much thought been put into uh, a, a circuit breaker or a safety net, so I could see things like uh, a low-income household having two people, co-owners, who can't file a head of household return. So do they get a rebate, or do they get half a rebate, or do they, or do they get two rebates? Yeah, so it's it's another complexity. We haven't work, worked out that yet. But we are, but again, we are working on that. Yeah. Right, Mark, you can describe some of the avenues we're exploring for people who don't file income tax returns. Um, okay, well, I can do that, and that's... Yeah, slightly different question. Let's see, where do I get to that? Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so, because of this problem of, of the average is high, what the, the amount of variation, um, in order to help low and moderate income people who may get hurt by this, um, these are a couple of new ideas I'm, I'm throwing out. Permit me, Senator, that we haven't talked about this yet. Um, uh, so um, one thing you could do is reduce or eliminate the rebates for the highest income.
households, all right? So if you're in the top 20%, you don't get a rebate, or you only get a piece of a rebate, and shift some of that money lower down the income spectrum. That would be one way to do it. Um, another way to do it is not return 100% of money to businesses. Right? right now, the design of it is that all the money that businesses and institutions put in will go back to them. You could not do 100%. You could do maybe 80% goes back to them and use 20% for lower income households. I'm just, but I've just thrown these out. These have not been vetted by anyone yet. <laughs> yes. Mark, since the sales tax is one of the most regressive taxes, if you use this money to reduce the sales tax, would that be effective? Well, it's, it's what I said before. If we go back up several slides, um, the sales tax is regressive, but it's not as regressive as the carbon tax. So it helps, but doesn't help enough, right? Um, all right, then, then you have to ask, how are we going to give the money back? Which is sort of a detailed, but an important one. And there's several considerations in how you do this. One is you don't want to make it too expensive for the state to return the money. You don't want to create a huge new bureaucracy to send these rebates. A second aspect is you do want it to be visible. You want people to understand that they are getting a carbon tax rebate, right? And um, hopefully the more visible the better because they'll see that, oh, I'm paying more for fossil fuels, but I'm actually getting the money back. And a third consideration is timing. Um, especially if you're low or moderate income, you don't want to have to wait till the end of the year to get your money back. Um, so you need to kind of balance all those considerations in how you, in how you give the money back. Um, so one way to do it, or there's a couple ways you could do it just within the income tax system. That would be simple, would not create any bureaucracy, would be very easy for the Department of Revenue to implement. One would be to increase the personal exemption. Um, if you decrease the sales tax, the income tax rate, it does nothing for poor people. But if, um, if you're relatively low income, but you still pay income tax, if you make the personal exemption bigger, that helps every household an equal amount. Um, because we have a flat income tax rate, so if you make the personal exemption $100 bigger, it saves every household $5.30, no matter what your income is. Um, so you could do a very large increase in the personal exemption, would be one way to do it. Um, that would really hide things. Like if you did that, nobody would under quite understand what's going on. You could create a separate carbon tax credit, um, put that in the income tax system. So everybody gets a $500 carbon tax credit, and it's just one more line in your state income tax filing. Um, and you could, you know, maybe highlight it somehow. Um, that would be a little bit more recognizable, but it still might not be very obvious unless you're the person who, who uh, actually works out your income tax return. Um, another way to do it would be to have the Department of Revenue actually send out separate checks that say carbon tax rebate on it. Right? So that would be obvious. Um, it would cost some money, right? The Department of Revenue would have to send out a lot of checks. Direct deposit. Um, uh, right, so electronic deposit would be one way, and then hopefully people read, read their bank statements then. Um, so that's another way to do it. Uh, and I'm actually waiting for the Department of Revenue to give me a number on how much they think it'll cost to do that. Um, then that all works for people who file state income taxes. Some people don't because they're too low income. Um, and DOR tells me that's about 9%, represents about 9% of people in the state whose households don't file state income taxes. You want to get the money to them, but it's trickier how to even find them. So um, the proposal that we're looking at right now is to have the Department of Revenue and the agencies that run low-income programs share their information. Um, so that includes uh, fuel assistance, which is available to people below a certain income level, SNAP, which is supplemental nutrition assistance, otherwise known as food stamps, um, or monthly utility bills. Uh, these are easier than the utility bills because these are both government agencies that 
the state controls. So you could have them cross-check their lists and then say, well, these, these people, these households who, are on, who get SNAP, we know they're not paying income tax because they're not on DOR's rolls. So we'll have SNAP, well, so somehow we'll send them a check. Um, it could either be SNAP doing it or it could be SNAP just informs the Department of Revenue and the Department of Revenue sends them a check even though they're not income tax payers. Um, same thing with fuel assistance. So these are other details that we're working out, but so far the state agencies involved have, have told me they don't really see any big problem with doing this. Um, they think it'll work. Uh, and you might want to provide some extra help for heating oil users because it's twice as expensive as gas is. All right, another issue is the high driving mileage. And this turns out to be a big issue, um, that gasoline is going to be a bit over half of the carbon tax. Um, it's just the way it is now. Um, part of the reason for that is because in electricity, we've cleaned up the electricity supply some. We don't have coal anymore. We have, hardly have any oil in the electricity supply. And natural gas has less carbon dioxide than oil or coal, although somebody may bring up the issue of methane leakage, which we'll worry about that too. Um, but the basic answer is that gasoline is a little more than half of the impact. So a lot of what, whether you pay, of how much you pay, will depend on how much you drive. All right? So the question is how to deal with that. Um, and it does mean some of this is geographic, some of it is size of household, some of it is where your job is compared to where you work. Um, but part of that, if you're thinking especially about low-income people, is that if you live in Boston and you don't own a car, you don't buy any gasoline at all, and you actually will do fairly well under this system. But if you're low-income and you live out somewhere in the Berkshires or even in, in the middle of the state and you drive everywhere, and you might have a 30 or 40 mile commute to get to work, um, then you could wind up fairly far behind. Um, so the question is whether, whether to create some kind of mechanism for giving extra assistance to those folks. Um, this is just one possible set of numbers that I've thrown out, um, but we have some very detailed data on driving in the state. And out of the 351 cities and towns in the state, 155 towns, which represent about a fifth of the state's households, average driving miles is one-third or more above the average for the state. So we're saying in these 155 towns, people drive a lot. Um, you could target a break just to people who live in those towns. Um, would be one way of uh, just a geographic focus. Um, or you could do it by individual household. Um, you could, we actually do have records from your inspection, your annual inspection, of how many miles everyone has driven in recent years. Mm -hmm. So you actually could base it on how many miles somebody drove in the last couple of years. You don't want to do it based on this year because you don't want to give people an incentive to drive more. Right. But if you did it based on a couple of years back, that would work. Um, you could also um, have an income qualification where you only gave this to people below a certain income level, um, which probably makes more sense, but it also involves then having a lot of people go through an income qualification process, which may or may not be something that we want to do. So British Columbia has a large rural uh, population. And from what I've read, they've addressed this pretty well, and it's working pretty well up there. Have you looked at how they've uh, tackled this of, of people that drive more and, and see what they've done to solve this problem? Um, yeah, I actually do need to look more at that, but you're right that British Columbia is sort of like, we have Boston and then the west, they have the south. The southern part of the province is the urban part, and the northern part is the rural part, and they are giving an extra break to people who live in the rural part of the province. What, what about public transportation? That sort of works the other way. I mean, uh, in areas where there's very good access to public transportation, you are 
driving will go down. And uh, so, well, that's right. Which is why I'm saying, if you live in Boston, you've got an opportunity to miss a lot of the impact here. Um, you may not even have a car. Um, so you target by community. Well, you could, um, and that's what this would do. So when I say 155 towns, um, that does not include, when I looked at the data, none of the state cities fall into this. So Lowell, Lawrence, Brockton, Springfield, Worcester, etc. cetera. Um, none of the, on, on average, none of the cities have high driving mileage. Um, but remember, again, that's on average. So it might hide, you know, somebody who lives in Worcester might get a job that's 50 miles from their home, right? And, you know, these days you take what job you can get, right? Isn't it because uh, this phases in over such a long time? I mean, and, and the, the signal is so weak to start with, it's going to take years really very slowly to, to be propagated through the system. Those people, you know, the, the price of gasoline jumps all around so much now, I can't imagine that's going to be that much of an effect on them um, for a long time. It's, well, depends on how much you spend, but just as a rough example, if you're spending, which some households are, when I've looked at the data, say $4,000 a year on gasoline, and there's a lot of moderate income households who are spending that much. It's not a majority, but it's a fair number. Um, by the fifth year, we might be increasing the price of gas by close to 10%. So you'd be adding $400 to your cost of living. Um, and I agree, right? It does jump. You know, we're talking about 30 cents a gallon that people experience that all the time now. Um, so it's true. You don't, compared to the international fluctuations, it's not huge. Um, and we are giving people time to adjust. Yeah, so the, I, th I thought the whole point was we're trying to get people to gradually shift. Well, so if you don't have a signal... Well, I would say, I mean, there is a dilemma here. Yeah. That you have two simultaneous objectives. Mm -hmm. You want to get people to use less, but you don't want to hit them over the head and kill them in the first couple of years. All right? Mm -hmm. um, you just, um, especially if they're lower on the income scale. I think there's more of a political problem, frankly, and there is because I can see how this could be used as a club, um, but I don't see this as being a pr practical. One, frankly. Yeah, I I don't think that it's um. When you say it's a political problem, I, I don't Actually, think. Could I, could I take a, a, a crack sure. at just a yeah. <laughs> comment here? But, see, first of all, you can see the extraordinary detail uh, that Mark has summoned up for us to wrestle with. Uh, but to speak to the, the politics of it just for a moment, this isn't just a choice for the politicians. It's actually a choice for the citizenry. We can up the price signal and increase the, the pressure on all of us or the incentives on all of us to uh, decrease carbon consumption, but it requires bumping the tax. Uh, we haven't written the bill yet. It doesn't have to stay at $30 per metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. It could go higher and the price signal would be clearer, but the financial impact would also be clearer. So we're struggling to get it right, and really, uh, whatever the legislature struggles with in this respect is just a microcosm. It, it reflects what all of us need to struggle with, because uh, this is a pogo problem. The enemy is us. Uh, we all are kind of in a high consumption economy and culture, and how do we want to, given the urgency of the problem, how do we want to mediate? Clearer signal, more cost, muffled signal, but at a lesser impact and a lesser cost. Uh, we're not committed to anything for sure. We're struggling to figure out what people want to tolerate for themselves and also what, what they want to impose on, on their neighbors who may make less money. So it's a, it's a, it is a tough one, but we have to make this voyage. <laughs> Would uh, public uh, transportation be, uh, be exempt from uh, the carbon tax? Um, that's a good question. Um, we actually have not talked about that. 
We need to. <laughs> so we could. Uh, the, the, I, I, think it, I think we should impose the carbon tax on every use of carbon because public buses can also uh, transition to cleaner fuels. You can reinvest in a cleaner fleet. I, I do think, even though it's somewhat, again, counterintuitive, that, that we all should struggle with this equilibrium that we're wrestling with here, including local and state government. But, but that's just uh, my policy instinct. I'd be interested in what you guys think. Um, I, I would agree with that, that if the voters decide that tax like this is it, to make social change, to be more efficient, to lower our carbon footprint. Um, but there are some people that can't change or are in positions like renters, which is a huge part of the population. They don't have control over what heating system is, is in the in the building, uh, how well insulated it is, uh, and they don't have the the, the ownership to, to make the change. Uh, how would they how would you handle that in kind of where they're paying the utility bills but they're not getting, they're only getting a standard credit and have no way to, to change their situation. I think the equity problem of r rental uh, is, is a very, is a one that's worth thinking about very carefully. And I, again, I don't, we're thinking about different rebate systems. A as you know, there is a, right now on the state income tax, uh, we give a special break for renting. And we could, we could conceivably build on that. Mark, do you have any thoughts? Sir? Well, um, one piece of it is to do what's done now, which is people who are low income and um, are eligible for what's called fuel assistance. Uh, the acronym is LIHE, um, but it's fuel. So it's just called fuel assistance, in which you do get some money to help you pay your, your heating bill. Um, we can take the rebate money and put it into that part of the system. Um, so that it's particularly helping people who are renters um, and if, if they're paying the heating bill. Um, and the way the state agency does it now, um, they actually give you more money if you have fuel oil than if you have natural gas. Um, but tenants, tenants are a problem. Um, the state, well, it's actually the utilities that run the energy efficiency programs in the state, the electric and gas utilities. Um, have been under a lot of pressure the last few years to improve programs for renters or for rental housing. And honestly, I think that has not gone very well. It's a, um, it's a very difficult situation yeah. where you have an owner that's made an investment in the property, and the more he spends on the property, the less his return is. So he's not willing to do the capital investment in the energy. Could you explain that? Why is there less a return the more you put Because the, the systems like a better furnace or a better, uh, more efficient, uh, maybe tankless hot water heater versus a, a cheap you know, tank hot water heater adds to his cost. But he doesn't operate the machine. Uh, the, the cost of operating the machine is borne by the renter, uh, who usually does not know what the utilities are prior to rental. But, but the tenants that pay their own utilities would find that apartment far more valuable. Because they would have lower utilities, so, so they'd be incentivized to want to seek out apartments that had those improvements, which um, would have they, a long payback. They, they would, um, if they, if they, and if they know. Um, so, so actually, well, one of the answers to that that goes along with what you said, Zori, is there have been state laws proposed that would require. This has been done more for sale of homes and rentals that would require the buyer of a home to be shown what the utility bills were before over the last couple of years. And you could do that for renting also, which I think that would be a very good idea. Another thing that we do, of course, is that if, you have, if, you're, if you're renting to low-income tenants, the efficiency programs are free to the landlord. It's 100% paid, um, so it's a very good deal for landlords to do it. Um, there's a waiting list. I was going to say, you have limited funds. There, there is a, a third option, and as Mark's, we're, we're going to be doing, I think, a number of things in tandem because yes. 
this whole question of lowering the state's carbon footprint is so complex. I can tell you what they do in a lot of European countries and in Australia. They, uh, and this has been proposed for the city of Boston as a beginning here for Massachusetts, they, they put a rating on the building, both the rental apartment, the residential home, the business, and you know going in whether you're getting an A, B, C, or D building in terms of cost of heating. Uh, and those ratings, it's, it's amazing, you walk around Sydney, Australia, and all the, si all the for rent signs tell you whether what you're going to get, they'll tell you it's a, it's a green building, or it's an orange building, or a red building. And they use it for marketing. And the, the, other thing, the other thing you can do is you can encourage, uh, there's a thing called a green lease where the, uh, the tenant and the owner split the benefits of the uh, energy efficiency. So this has become an, uh, a new thing in the marketplace, and we could encourage people sort of outside of the realm of the carbon tax, but we could encourage uh, landlords and tenants to have these green leases where they both benefit. Sure. Hey, you, you guys do the computer modeling, I guess, Remy. Now that DOI has all our returns, could you create a model and sort of like do all the returns of every resident and look for, oh, these are the flyers, are these, this is the center of the, the center of the pack, uh, look at who's getting clobbered, who's okay, and things to look for the errors in your model. Um, the problem with doing that is that the Department of Revenue doesn't know what people spend on energy. All they have is their income. Yep. Um, so you need to have both. Well, you can make some assumptions, but they, I guess it depends on how, how flawed they are. Yeah, so, and I, as I said early on, the assumptions aren't very good. That yeah. Even the survey data is not great. Well, lots of questions here. Sorry, you've been up a couple of times, so I'm going to applaud other people. Um, yeah, um, over there. A quick thing I don't quite understand, where you have a 20% cut in carbon tax on gas for a household. I thought you, you were saying that the tax would actually happen when the energy enters the state. And so how are you going to be cutting the carbon tax on gas? Do you, you, you mean just 20, 20 you didn't, increase in rebate? Yeah. OK. But, but can we clarify that, Mark? I, I, I know you're, everybody's uh, thinking on all these topics is still tentative. Uh, we're still exploring different hypotheses. It isn't clear, just to be candid, how far upstream you can go in a state that doesn't extract or refine petroleum products. It looks as if upstream is pretty much downstream for a state like Massachusetts. And were that it were not so, it would be great. And in other states, you, you see a, a marketing message, especially on the part of progressives, that we do not have available for us here. And the marketing message is, you're going to slap this tax on the polluters. And the, the implication is that you're going to put a carbon tax on oil refiners and on natural gas extraction and on coal mining. We don't mine coal. We don't extract natural gas. We don't, uh, <laughs> uh, so far. And, uh, and we don't refine these products either. So we have to go downstream compared to other places. And that, uh, that basically means that all of us are forced to confront our own carbon footprints and to ask what we can do about it. Um. Can I follow up a little on, on, um, on that? And uh, I'm thinking from the point of view of the consumer or the, the citizen. Um, you're talking about the taxes actually imposed upon importers of the gas or the oil or whatever. Is that correct? Well, as I say, it, it's here we may not be able to get very abstract. It may wind up being a downstream tax. I'm not sure in the case of gasoline that we're going to uh, put it on the tanker truck that's just come in from a refinery in Oklahoma. We may, as a practical matter, have to collect it at the pump. What's your, what's your sense, Mark? Well, can I just you know, yeah. say that you know, from the point of view of the consumer of all this kind of stuff, all you do is you look at the price of gas, and I don't know about anybody else in this room, but I just go, oh, gas went up or down 5 cents or 10 right. cents. Or, I don't think about whether it's in terms of tax or whether it's in terms of the cost of the gasoline or the same thing for oil or, or whatever you, you heat with. 
And so somehow you have to be able to make a connection between these, particularly if it's done at the import level. So here's what I think is going to happen, uh, but, and, and Mark will correct me. You, you stated it beautifully. The whole point of this system isn't that we figure out that the cost is attributable to X, a carbon tax as opposed to the normal fluctuations in the price of energy. The way the economists supposedly, uh, what they want us to do is to react to the total cost of something by, cons by consuming less of it. And, and actually, that isn't what we do, although we struggle with it because things aren't perfectly elastic, we can't adjust right away. Still, over time, if you raise the price of something, especially something that you don't want people consuming too much of, like fossil fuels, people are going to find a way over time to use less of it, even without knowing what caused the increase. And that is what we want folks to do. Um, and, and let me just say that um, you know, there's, there's an, always an 80-20 rule in politics. 80% of our worry goes to 20% of the problem. The 20% or the 10% or the of the problem here are folks who don't have a lot of money but who live in rural places. Now, most of the poor people in Massachusetts are going to do fine under a carbon tax, remember, because they don't live in rural places. 80% of them live outside those 151 towns. They live in cities and may not own a car. And by the way, who are these poor people, just so that we get our, their uh, college students who have yet to earn incomes and their retired people who have stopped earning incomes. So um, a lot of these folks are, live in small households. That's why family size among the poor is not extravagantly large. Um, but the, one of the overarching questions is here, and we're just going to have to confront it as a society, is do we want people living in places where they travel a lot and of necessity use a lot of fossil fuel? Or do we want, over time, denser development, closer to mass transit, different housing policies that encourage us to live in probably smaller dwellings, which would reverse the trend in Lexington, <laughs> uh, for the sake, for the sake of uh, living more densely but with shared common space. I suspect that over time, regardless of whether there's ever a carbon tax, in truth, the trend of the last 40 years is going to continue. And what has that trend been? We've been emptying out rural places. Rural, we are more urban today than we were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30, 40, 50, 100 years ago, right? It's been a constant story in the United States of emigration toward, to, toward metropolitan areas and emptying out of rural ones. This is going to, uh, the cost of carbon is going to accelerate that trend. And, but it does mean that there will be fewer regressive impacts over time on people who are poor but who continue to live rurally. It's, uh, this is going to be tough, but we've, it's probably living in a rural place where travel takes place over dozens and dozens of miles um, is going to be increased, it's going to be fraught. But it's been that way, as I say, for a century. And this is accelerating a trend that's already underway. The long and the short of it is, though, not a lot of people are going to be hit. Most of the poor in Massachusetts are the urban poor, and the urban poor make out well in a carbon tax scheme. Um, it's been pointed out to me that we're running out of time. Do we, when do we actually have to be out of here? We have a very hard close at 9. Yeah. So, okay. so, so, so we need to stop in 15 minutes. Well, well, ten, well, uh, really, ten. 7 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so I'm going to... I'm going to say a little bit more and hold questions and we'll see what we can get to. I've got a bunch of other slides that are about what happens on the business side of this and the tax on businesses and institutions. I will refrain from going through them to save time and just sort of try to summarize. Um, Massachusetts is very different from a lot of states. All the heavy industry is gone. We don't refine oil. Um, we're an incredibly knowledge-based economy in which energy is a pretty small percentage of the cost for most industries in the, in the state. So the analysis is that if you put a carbon tax on, it's going to have fairly small impacts on our leading industries, which include real estate, professionals and consultants, um, hospitals, 
ambulatory health care, um, universities, and so on. Um, the cost is very small. It's like less than a tenth of a percent impact on costs or on net costs. You know, a lot of these industries, they'll actually come out ahead when you, um, when you combine a tax with a rebate. Um, there's a few industries that will come out behind, at least according to these numbers. One of them is construction, which is fairly energy intensive, and most of the manufacturing industries will come out somewhat behind, although our biggest manufacturing industry, which is computer and electronic parts, actually will come out ahead, what the numbers show. But some of the more traditional manufacturing industries will come out behind. Um, again, it's not enormous amounts of money. It's a tenth of a percent of their sales revenue. In, in the highest case for chemical manufacturing, it's almost 1%. It's the biggest impact I've identified. Um, so we think that uh, for the most part, this isn't going to be a big problem for industry. Um, and, and I'm sure we will hear from them for the ones who think that it will be. Uh, and again, let me mention that People historically have talked about this a lot as a tax swap. Increase one tax, cut another tax. Turns out that doesn't work on the industry side either because the main business tax is the business excise tax, the corporate excise tax. And that only applies to profit-making corporations. Well, what are the biggest industries in this state? A lot of them are um, education, higher education, all of which the universities are almost all nonprofits. Hospitals, most or almost all of which are nonprofits. Um, cities and towns are like the cities, towns, and the state government are like the third biggest industry in the state. It doesn't pay taxes. Um, so all those institutions would wind up paying the carbon tax and getting nothing back. Um, so it doesn't work to use the tax system. Um, instead, we're talking about giving it back as a proportion of their share of employment in the state or their share of payroll. Um, then, it, then it does work for nonprofits. Yeah. Okay, so we have like five, seven minutes, so I'll take a couple of questions and then we'll have to stop. Hi, I'm, I'm Dave Wilson. I'd like to throw the brain on because I like to bring on this happy guy. He's the, he's the father of the carbon tax right, right well, there. I did it in 73. <laughs> presented it to Foxman, who was a wonderful guy, one of my heroes, and he loved it except he said, that's going to hurt the inflation, we've got a lot of inflation, and I haven't heard it, so I cured it. I, I came up with a scheme to cure it, and I haven't heard anybody be worried about the inflation. Um, the numbers that uh, Mike had for his um, bill was for five bucks for um, a ton of carbon. That comes to 1.3 cents a gallon. And that's produced by the wave of a butterfly wing in Acapulco. <laughs> it's nothing. Um, my, my, the tax that I've been modeling for many years, and I'm sorry that uh, you haven't heard of it, it starts with uh, t 20 times that at the end of six months. You have nothing for six months, and then the first increment is 20 times that, which is about 25 cents a gallon. And um, when you get to that level, you do have to worry about uh, inflation. So uh, I, I volunteer, if you want to get in touch with me, I can tell you how to cure the inflation problem. <laughs> and I, I believe that we've been modeling it for 40 years, and I thought we'd covered all these things. And it depresses me a little bit to find that you have been all paid by the uh, glorious government to uh, find out all about it again. <laughs> Mark is displeased by that. <laughs> um, in the back. Uh, hi, I, my name is Kim Slack. I have a question for you, Senator Baird. I really appreciate all the work that you put into this. I wonder how you see this kind of unfolding, that particularly the political process. Um, you know, we weren't able to pass a gas tax. Um, there's a lot of obstacles. Right? Do you have any kind of quick kind of hints? Well, well actually, uh, and, and I hope this is a good question. Off. I hope this is a, a neutral statement. It's not. Uh, but the, the state legislature regularly raises taxes. Uh, it does tend to do so in response to a perceived crisis. We're required every year to balance the budget. 
So we don't, we can't uh, borrow, we can't run a deficit. One reason the state legislature regularly raises taxes is because hit with a sudden economic downturn, for example, programs can't take it on the chin. So we tend to reduce the programs, but not, but we also tend to raise taxes. We actually did raise the gas tax 18 months ago. It went from 21 cents a gallon to 24 cents a gallon. Uh, we didn't we didn't wait for public opinion to reach 50% plus one. At the time we raised the gas tax to save our roads and bridges, uh, public support of the tax was polling two to one against. So the, the, the blunt political answer to your question is that legislatures do the unpopular thing when they must, and they do it on a regular basis, and then they go before the voters. And uh, you either throw the bums out or you give the bums a pass. <laughs> and that, I think, is uh, going to happen as we confront climate change. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, last question. Yeah, I have, um, just following up on that, I, I have a, a poll here from the Boston Globe saying that people don't mind paying taxes as long as they know that the money is well spent. And 86% agree with that, and there are only 11% don't agree. Now, is this the best way to spend the revenue from the tax to give it back, all of it, or should some of it not go, just like with the Reggie scheme, to actually uh, uh, further efficiency measures, or even go back to communities to uh, so you know, get on board on the green you. development? So I'll just say very briefly that, that my voters, are, like a lot of us in this room, are ambivalent, really. They don't want to see government wasting money. They don't like the T word. They don't like to be taxed. But they do care about the quality of services. They look to legislatures to resolve ambivalence because nobody's wholeheartedly uh, in favor of one choice or the other. In this particular case, we have polled on the question of revenue neutrality, give people the money back but buy a different route, versus spending on, on programs. The bill I submitted two years ago is revenue positive. We spend the first $100 million on roads and bridges. This time around, uh, I'm going to take Mark's advice uh, and we're going to make it revenue neutral. When you poll, support for a carbon tax to fight climate change doubles if you give the money back. It goes down steadily if it becomes another government taxation scheme. Don't get me wrong, we're going to support all the current state programs that we have, and I hope we're going to grow them as the economy rebounds, using the income tax, the property tax, and the sales tax. With respect to this particular levy, it's so urgent to fight climate change, I think we have to go with where the voters seem to be, which is revenue neutrality. Yes. together to get this carbon tax passed. Thank you all.